Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at Second Baptist. I'm glad you could be with me today. Um, we are continuing in our study from the book of Ezekiel. And this lesson today is found in chapter 20. And, um, you know, we have talked each week about how Ezekiel was speaking to uh, the Israelites who were in exile in Babylon. Um, and so this week, it, it really brings out the um, importance of the judgment of God that was happening, you know, on the people, uh, on the Israelites. And it's a, a reminder to us, you know, that God doesn't play around, I guess you might say. We sometimes try to play around with God, but God doesn't, God doesn't play around, you know. Um, and we'll, we'll look at what happened here, and then, you know, we'll talk about it some more. So Ezekiel chapter 20, let's go ahead and jump into it and read the first three verses. Now, in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth of the month, certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Do you come to inquire of me? As I live, declares the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Um, now, there's, a, there's quite a few things here that we can pull out from this, um, this little three verses. First of all, you know, again, uh, Ezekiel was very specific on when this happened, uh, you know, down to the, the day of the month even, that he was sitting... Uh, and the elders of Israel came and sat before him. Now, those were elders that were in exile. And so they came to inquire of the Lord. And, you know, we, we have to remember that back in these times, the Spirit of God was not with everyone uh, but with certain people. You know, where now, if we believe and we are followers of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit with us to guide us. But in those days, the elders of Israel had to inquire of God through the priest or through a prophet, you know, or something like that, to get a word from God. So they didn't just have a word from God when they, you know, prayed like we do and you know, God guided them, uh, gave them, you know, the answer or through other people giving him, them the answer, you know, the way things happen now. And so they came to inquire from Ezekiel, but really they were inquiring from God. Um, and so then in verse 2, Ezekiel says, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, so as they came to inquire, Ezekiel, maybe he sat and thought and prayed, and then the words that God wanted him to speak were there, and he spoke them, you know, as God directed him. And so then he speaks this, um, this, these sentences that show that God is very unhappy with them. Can you imagine if God said this to you when you tried to pray, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel, this is verse 3, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Do you come to inquire of me as I live, declares the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. So he, you know, he he answered them very harshly and 
it shows, you know, how upset God is with them. Now let's go on forward to verse 4. Verse 4, will you judge them? Will you judge them, son of man? Make them know the abominations of their fathers. Okay, now what he's saying to uh, Ezekiel is um, remind these elders of Israel of the abominations of their fathers. And so then it's going to go on forward from there what the things that Ezekiel said. So the, the first part that I read where the Lord God says this, that wasn't all that the Lord God said, if that makes sense. And so uh, now Ezekiel is going to begin to bring out um, the history, I guess, of the abominations of the fathers. Okay, so let's look at verses 5 and 6. Uh, make them know the abominations of their fathers and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, on the day when I chose Israel and swore to the descendants of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, when I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God, on that day I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land that I had selected for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Okay, so he's giving a history here. And, you know, the children of Israel had known who God was before uh, they were held captive in Egypt. But this was the beginning of, you know, their real, I guess, relationship with, with God when... Um, when Moses came and they, you know, followed Moses and they were brought out of Egypt and out of slavery and all the things that happened then. Um, so he says, when, he, when I chose Israel and, you know, swore to the house of Jacob uh, and made myself known to them in Egypt. And how did he make himself known? By, if you, you know, all of the things that God did there, the plagues, to show his power to Pharaoh and everybody else. I mean, he wasn't just showing his power to Pharaoh. He was showing his power to the Israelites as well, who had forgotten, forgotten maybe some things about God. Um, okay, and then in verse 7 to 9, um, so he's, he's going to bring them out into the land that I had selected for them. I said to them, cast away each of you the detestable things of his eyes and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them, to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived, in whose sight I made myself known to them by bringing them out of the land of Egypt. So even as they were captives in Egypt, you know, God was saying to them, put away the idols of Egypt and the detestable things. And they were not even willing to do that. And so he, um, he resolved that he would pour out his wrath on them. But... For the sake of his name, he says, um, let me take, read that again. I acted for the sake of my name that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived. 
So in other words, to, um, to show that he kept his word because he had said that Israel was his chosen people. Because he had done that, then to keep his name, you know, the integrity of his name, I guess that's what I want to say, he uh, brought them out of Egypt, even though they had not yet put away the idols of Egypt or the detestable things that God um, had asked them to put away. So, you know, even from the beginning, they were rebellious in that way. Okay, let's see. Then in verses 10 to 12, So I took them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and informed them of my ordinances, by which, if a man observes them, he will live. Also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Okay, now, you know, he's just... Again, relaying the history of his relationship with them through Ezekiel. So, so he they're they're rehearsing, you know, past history here, and saying, you know, I brought you out of Egypt. You were there in the wilderness, and then I gave you, um, I gave you the the statutes and the ordinances that you should live by. So he began to tell them, you know, these are the things I want you to do or not do. Uh, and began to give them those rules. And then he gave them the Sabbath as a sign between God and the Israelites that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. <coughs> now that is a... Uh, that's a point that we need to think about. We don't, you know, we don't uh, worship on the Sabbath, which would be Saturday, you know, as the as the uh, Jewish people do now. You know, their Sabbath is Saturday. So we don't do that, but we have a day set aside to worship God and to... Um, and so that we might know that it is the Lord who sanctifies us. So this is something that we should respect. You know, back in the day when my grandmother was alive, you know, you did not sew on Sunday or farm or do any of the things that, you know, that, you would might do the other six days of the week. I mean, there were songs about it. You know, ain't it a shame to to sew on Sunday when you got Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You know, we used to sing that song when I was a little girl. And, I mean, that was a very strong teaching of the church that Sunday was a day that was set aside. And now it's not as much. I mean, we still have some remnants of that. I guess some businesses are closed. And, you know, we try to make Sunday different, um, those of us who are believers. But even, even for us, you know, we do things that our grandparents would have been appalled to, to know that, that we did, you know, on Sunday, on the Sabbath. Uh, or on Sunday, you know, the, the Lord's Day, we'll call it. And so, you know, God is just rehearsing here then and, t and saying, you know, I gave the Sabbaths to the Israelites so that they could remember every week uh, on this day that I am the Lord who sanctifies them, who makes them, uh, you know, better or more acceptable in 
the sight of God, I guess you might say. Okay, then verse 13 and 14. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes, and they rejected my ordinances, by which, if a man observes them, he will live. And my Sabbaths they greatly profaned. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them in the wilderness, to annihilate them. But I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations before whose sight I had brought them out. Okay, so again, God relents from completely destroying the Israelites and wiping them out in the wilderness, even though that's what he felt like doing is what he's saying. But because of his name, that his name should not be profaned, or in other words, the other nations around, he was he was also doing this and brought the Israelites out of Egypt to show his great power and to show his great name so that all the nations around could see that God is the only God. God is the powerful God. God is the one, you know. And so because of the testimony of his name, he did not wipe out the Israelites in the wilderness, even though that's what he felt like doing. And, of course, we remember that in the wilderness was when Moses went up on the mountain and uh, was receiving the Ten Commandments from God, and that's when the Israelites, while he was gone, they decided to build the golden calf and start worshiping it, you know. So obviously they had brought the these pagan practices from Egypt that they had learned there, and they were, you know, bringing those out as soon as as they had a chance and, and decided, okay, you know, we'll just make our own God to worship and... and you know, it it really amazes me when I think about it because I feel like they had seen all those plagues that happened. They saw the way God worked to bring them out of Egypt. They saw the Passover when the blood was on the doorpost and the firstborn, you know, of every family died. And then they, I mean, that was such a, miraculous thing that happened uh, when they were able to come out of Egypt and then they got to the Red Sea and they you know they had no way to cross and God parted the waters and they walked through on dry land and so they had seen all of those things it, it just amazes me that they then turn right back around and begin to follow these other gods. It, it really doesn't make sense, does it? You know, and, but I, you know, it, I know this is what human nature, and perhaps if it had been us, we would have done the same thing if we were not believers already. You know, if we were um, a person who did not have the Holy Spirit to guide us to know that God is God and that. Uh, Jesus is the Savior and those things, if we did not have that, then our decision-making would be, um, you know, easily swayed, I guess, by the devil, really, you know. And you see people even today that make terrible decisions and you, over and over again, you know. And you think, why don't they do differently? Well, they don't have the Holy Spirit to guide them, maybe, you know, and they... They are like children, I guess, in a way that they just go back to what they know. And that's what the Israelites did, didn't they? When the going got tough, they didn't know where Moses was. He went up the mountain. He didn't come back for, you know, 40 days or whatever. Then they begin to, just like like children or, or like maybe anybody would do, they just went back to what they knew and tried to 
you make their own gods, you know. And so, you know, God is reminding them of all of those things. And then, let's continue on. Oh, okay. It, it ends it right there. So, if you read on forward in this chapter, it continues to talk about the, the abominations of the fathers and the things that they did and um, that they did not walk in the statutes and, and all of that. So read on forward a little bit in this chapter. I don't, you know, the, the lesson book ends to me sort of abruptly right there in verse 14. Some of it is is a repetition. You know, it, you know how the scripture will do, where it repeats kind of the same phrases and the same words again, uh, for emphasis, I think. And so it, it mentions, you know, all of the abominations of the fathers. And I was thinking today, as I was reading this, some of the abominations, and we mentioned a little bit of it in previous lessons. Um, about the baby sacrifices that they were doing and um, the idols that they were worshiping and other things like that. And we saw quite a bit of things like that in Africa where um, we, we never, you know, saw uh, someone that had done a baby sacrifice, but we heard that that was going on in a certain area. And then... Um, we saw Clint went to a place one time where the people were worshiping a rock, this little round rock. And then in Ghana, we would see, um, like we might, if we went on walking out in the bush, you might be going along and you would see a, a bowl beside a tree with some kind of like eggs floating in it and stuff like that. And it was just sitting there and it was like a, a sacrifice that someone had made. So the, the idea of idol worship is very um, alive and well in Africa even today and probably in other places in the world too. It's just that Africa is the one I'm the most familiar with. So, you know, it, the, the thought of the abominations of the fathers and the things that it mentions on further in this chapter, uh, it it, rem it brought that to mind for me. Now, so we'll end there with, you know, the, the lesson of, I guess, God's judgment on the forefathers. And then uh, Ezekiel is going to go on further as we study and talk about, okay, and now, you know, God's judging you as well, uh, that he told them over and over again, especially these uh, these uh, idol worship things. That was, you know, the main thing that kept coming up and coming up. They were told over and over and over again, stop doing it, and they didn't. And now this judgment has come. Um, in your book, we I discovered a, a dilemma as I was studying this lesson, the next lesson jumps over to Matthew. And I couldn't figure out why did they do that. It didn't seem to tie together or anything. But then I discovered that for some reason we are off. I, I, I don't know how long, how many years it's been this way. But we are, we are off on the lessons. And so the lesson for next week would have been the lesson for... Uh, Christmas and so it, that's why they jumped over to Matthew and stuck in a Christmas lesson and then they're, we're going to come back to Ezekiel and so what I'm going to do instead of doing that is I'm going to be continuing in Ezekiel I'm going to just pick out um, something in between there and that's not covered in one of the other lessons and we're going to do that next week. And then we'll resume with the next lesson, which is also Ezekiel. So that we kind of 
you know, stick with Ezekiel for now. Because we did have Christmas and we, you know, we talked about those things. But um, I think it will be more logical for us to just, you know, not do that lesson on Matthew next week. So um, it'll be a surprise then, won't it, when we meet back together again. But I'd like to continue this uh, particular train of thought that we're on this week about um, God's judgment and uh, of the forefathers and then uh, what is, you know what's happening now with the Israelites as we're studying in the time of Ezekiel. So thank you for being with me and we'll, uh, we'll see you again next week.